<laughs> Wonderful. And Amy uh, is is there, I know for sure. Okay. All right. Well, it's uh, 630. I guess we'll, we're on. Uh, want to thank everybody for uh, attending. Welcome back to the new school year. And uh, again, I want to thank the officers of HAGS for uh, coordinating and, and doing all the preparation for this meeting, past meetings, and the future meetings uh, to bring you the wonderful uh, content. And uh, again, Mike putting together the uh, being, being the treasurer and putting together these Zoom meetings, and Amy putting together the uh, dynamite uh, announcements, and uh, and our our vice president for booking and and so forth, uh, the speaking, and. Uh, want to let you know we're, we're going to be virtual through 2021 uh which i guess i can move on from that right away uh don't forget to put your name tag in the chat box hit the chat box to everyone and uh get your name and p and your uh pg or pe number and for your pdh time uh the program will be recorded, so if you missed it or had to duck out, let us know. Our next meeting is October 14th, and it'll be on big data. Mike, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, A conspiracy? Uh, so um, uh, Daniel Hummer is going to be the, the our next speaker. He is currently... Uh, uh, a professor at um, Southern Illinois University. Um, uh, and we've worked on some projects in the past using big data to understand earth systems stuff. Uh, he is gonna be talking about his use of that in data, not data, in um, uh, mineral ecology and some other stuff. Uh, should be very interesting, especially if, you, if you're, you're interested in geochemistry, mineralogy, or even just big data analytics and like visualizations. There's a kind of a, a bunch for everyone. Um, on there. Uh, if I also had one other announcement, um, it would be uh, after much discussion uh, amongst officers this summer, um, we talked about uh, adding on a, uh, a, a media officer, maybe someone who can wrangle the Facebook page and some other stuff uh, a little more so we can have kind of a better division of labor. If anyone is interested, if a current member or like you want to be a member and want to do that, um, please, uh, you know, chat to me um, during this or email me and we can, we can figure things out. Great. I was going to ask you if you had anything else. Uh, and I had forgotten about the new media officer position uh, opening up. Okay. Uh, so if, uh, there's no other announcements or, or anything, we'll get to the real reason you're here and that's to, uh, here, uh, Dr. Stephen Godfrey, uh, who present to us on the Calvert Marine Museum of Southern Maryland. Uh, he's the curator of paleontology. Uh, I'm sure m many of us envy him to be able to fool with fossils. Uh, his, his presentation uh, stems out of that uh, position and it's about Miocene fossils of Cal the Calvert Cliffs. Who would know there were cliffs in Maryland? Anyway, uh, he was born and raised in Quebec, Canada, and he's been a lifelong fossil and nature uh, fanatic. Uh, he collects collected fossils since he was a kid, like many of us. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science at Bishop's University, it's his PhD in paleontology from McGill University, both are Canadian locations, I presume, especially McGill. Uh, following two year postdoctoral doctorate, he uh, at University of Toronto, 
he moved to Alberta, which is the dinosaur capital of Canada, and became involved in paleontological exhibit work. In 1998, he became the curator of paleontology, his current position in Maryland, and uh, his mandate is collect, preserve, and interpret fossils from the Calvert Cliffs on the Chesapeake Bay. And he quarries these things by rappelling down the cliffs and uh, chipping them out of the cliffs. These uh, fossils are extinct whales and dolphins, eight to 18 million years old. Uh, he's published a lot of scientific papers on the attack feeding habits of the megalodon, uh, which devoured whales and became extinct about 2 million years ago. He was asked to review an action movie that involved a megalodon in the Marianas Trench concealed by a cloud of hydrogen sulfide. Uh, in addition to that, he loves to jump on the trampoline and paint. Uh, Stephen, uh, if you're on, we, the, the spotlight swings to you. Thank you very much, Kent. I would also like to thank Amy for the invitation to present to, to this group. I am now just going to share my screen. And uh, there, I think we're good to go. <clears throat> So uh, as you can see from the title of this presentation, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the geology and Miocene paleontology of Calvert Cliffs. Um, and when, when I talk about the Miocene paleontology, I'll introduce the invertebrates, but I'm gonna focus primarily on the vertebrates since that's my area of, uh, of research uh, interest. So as most of you probably already know, uh, the cliffs, Calvert Cliffs extend for about uh, 35 miles along the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay, south of Baltimore, south of Annapolis and Baltimore, and uh, to the east and southeast of Washington, D.C. And so you can see from this slide that uh, those bold yellow arrows point out where along uh, Calvert County those cliffs occur. And so, um, as Kent already mentioned, the, the age of the sediments that comprise the cliffs range in age from about 18 to 8 million years ago. And so you can see that puts them in the middle of the Miocene epoch. So relatively recently, when we look at the overall age of the earth. So there's roughly 10 million years of earth's geologic history preserved in the sediments uh, that comprise the cliffs. So here is uh, a photograph of a section of the cliffs and um, you can see that the, uh, the layers appear to be horizontal, and obviously they were laid down horizontally, uh, but now they dip to the southeast at about 11 feet down for every mile of length along the cliffs. And so as you move from north to south along the cliffs, the sediments dip down and they sort of come down to beach level so that you can study them. Also, I'd like you to notice that uh, the sediments that make up the cliffs are not indurated. Uh, you can go up to the cliff face and with your fingernails, you can start excavating actually into the cliffs themselves. Consequently, uh, you can see at the base of the cliff here to the right in this photograph, just at the waterline, um, during storms and high tides, the, the water, the waves will actually undercut the base of the cliffs. And since the sediments are not cemented together naturally, they erode relatively rapidly. And so, uh, that, that's what keeps the cliff face sheer and vertical, nearly vertical. But also you can see to the left in this photograph that there's a large amount of sediment that, that has come down. And so the cliff face can fail catastrophically. So we always have to be mindful when we're out along the cliffs, be very careful uh, to not spend very much time like right up against the base of the cliff and especially where it looks like the cliff is about to fall off and tumble down onto the beach. So this is a lovely illustration that was made of the full 35 mile length 
of Calvert Cliffs by Susan Kidwell, a geologist at the University of Chicago. And she did her PhD dissertation on the geology of the cliffs and measured sections all along the cliffs and came up with this illustration. Uh, notice though that the vertical scale has been uh, greatly exaggerated here, like 150 to one. But what I want you to notice from this illustration is the alternating pattern of that brick-like uh, brick -like imagery uh, to um, other kinds of sediments where there's no, no indication, no stippling or, or coloring in the illustration. And there are some bold lines which represent um, uh, periods of non-sedimentary deposition. So they're unconformities or disconformities in, in the, the section in, in this uh, throughout Calvert Cliffs. You'll notice that there's a repeating pattern that we start with a brick layer, the PP1, and that denotes uh, a layer that's highly fossiliferous, just chock full of fossils. And I'll show you some photographs of this in just a minute. And it alternates with uh, layers that to consist of a much finer grain sediment that are not nearly as fossiliferous. And then the pattern repeats itself where you get uh, a highly fossiliferous layer and then uh, a more clay-like layer. And so why is there this pattern that we see along Calvert Cliffs? Well, it comes about as a result of changes in the global temperature throughout the Miocene. So this uh, illustrates uh, what we think North America looked like during the Miocene or at about 16 million years ago. And you'll notice that there is no uh, snow or ice at the North Pole. And uh, there would have been less ice at the South Pole. And that's because on average during the Miocene, global temperatures were warmer than they are today. And the arrow is pointing at the Atlantic coastal plain, which for much of the Miocene was flooded, was underwater. So here you're gonna to have to imagine that we're in a very high flying airplane over the Atlantic Ocean. And we're looking west across the Delmarva Peninsula towards Calvert County between those two yellow arrows where Calvert Cliffs occur. And I'm seated at the green dot. That's where I am right now at the Calvert Marine Museum. And we're looking west towards Washington, D.C., towards the Piedmont and Appalachian Mountains. Well, during the Miocene, uh, this area for much of that time was underwater. And so here in this illustration, I've greatly exaggerated the depth of the Atlantic Ocean, um, this transgression, this transgressive um, Atlantic Ocean flooding over the Atlantic coastal plain, but it extended as far west as the fall line. And you'll notice that uh, where the cliffs are was fairly far removed from the coastline, from the shoreline, I should say. And so uh, the rivers that are flowing today into the Chesapeake Bay and into the Atlantic were flowing then. And they were carrying with them a sedimentary load, sediments that had been eroded from the Piedmont and Appalachian Mountains. And those sediments were flowing into the Atlantic and they were, they were settling out. So the coarser grain, heavier sediments, obviously close to shore, and the fine grain, silty sediments were staying suspended in the water and floating further out to sea before they finally settled. And so in this kind of a situation, you would have the deposition of the clay layers uh, in a situation that wasn't necessarily highly oxygenated, uh, an environment that wasn't great for mollusks. And so that's why there's not nearly the same concentration of fossils found in these deeper water, uh, fully marine, open ocean conditions as you would find in, in more shallow um, conditions. But during the Miocene, global temperatures did not remain the same, they fluctuated. And so if the temperature were to drop and you would put more ice and snow at the South Pole, uh, the water then would be pulled out of the oceans and we would then end up closer to the, to the shoreline. And you can see from this illustration that uh, that's what is, is depicted here, where uh, the, the sediments would be much coarser because we would be closer to where the rivers were flowing into uh, the Atlantic Ocean. And so uh, under conditions like this, it'd be much more favorable for mollusks to be living there. And so when I show you um, in just a few slides, some photographs of some of the layers along Calvert Cliffs, and they're just chock full of, of um, clamshells and, and, and gastropods, uh, you'll appreciate that it would be in this kind of environment much closer to shore, a more shallow a water environment. There were times though when uh, the sediments were not being deposited here, uh, there would have been forests growing, and these are represented by those disconformities that occur along the cliffs, times of, of, of erosion, before then the ocean came back in. So if you could time lapse um, 
time lapse to 10 million years represented by the sediments in the cliffs. You would see the Atlantic Ocean moving back and forth across the Atlantic coastal plain and the different kinds of sediments being represented by the different depths of, of the ocean above where those sediments were being deposited. Uh, then moving from this slide, uh, if the temperature warmed up again, the, the ocean would come back in, there'd be a, a new cycle that would repeat itself. And that's how we have this repeating pattern of uh, similar uh, groupings of, of sediments along Calvert cliffs. But because there's 10 million years represented by the fossils um, in the cliffs, we have a change in the biota as we move uh, from the older to younger sediments along the cliffs. So now I'm gonna show you a series of photographs uh, moving from the north end of Calvert Cliffs to the southern end. And here's a lovely photograph of Randall Cliff, which is just south of the town of Chesapeake Beach. And uh, the, uh, this photograph was taken when the gentleman who is, let's see if I can, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen. Uh, let's see, it would be here, yes. So this gentleman who's standing to, at the left end of the photograph, at the base of the cliff, had brought us out to show us the very front end, the very tip of a long snouted dolphin skull, a skull that was about four feet long, that had just started to erode from the base of the cliff. And we had permission from the property owner to excavate the skull, but we decided not to because above where this gentleman is standing, the cliffs looked very unstable. There were these giant sections of the cliff that looked like they were about to come down. And you can see that immediately to the south, to the right of the gentleman at the base of the cliff, there is hundreds of tons of sediment that had already fallen. And so we thought that it wouldn't be wise to use picks and start chopping and wailing away at the base of the cliff and uh, risk having um, you know, the sediments above us come tumbling down onto, onto, the, onto the beach. So like I said, we always have to be careful. We didn't excavate this skull and uh, we just had to leave it uh, to erode naturally uh, from, from the cliff face. So this is in about the middle, the midsection, the middle section of, of the cliffs. And it's at a place where the water is almost always up against the base of the cliff. And you can see here that this, uh, the base of the cliff, it's a clay sediment, very fine grain. So this, this represents the deepest water environment preserved along the cliffs. And then above it, you can see uh, that there is a, a narrow or a thin layer that's only about a foot and a half to two feet thick. Uh, this is also a deep water environment. It's a sediment starved uh, environment, uh, but it happens to preserve the highest concentration of fossil shark teeth and dolphin skulls that are preserved along Calvert Cliffs. And then above that, you can see where the clay sediments have dried out and they're spalling off as the cliffs erode naturally. So here we are a couple of miles further south at a place called Western Shores. And uh, you'll notice that to here at low tide, uh, the beach is all speckled sort of white and brown. Now all the white there are, here's a photograph of that um, heavily fossiliferous layer that I mentioned previously. You can see that it's just chock full of, uh, of, of clam shells, uh, snail shells. These are, all, these are all Miocene shells that um, some of them are preserved in life position in situ where they actually live. But these are for the most part death assemblages. This is the southernmost end of Calvert Cliffs at the Chesapeake Ranch Estates uh, during uh, deceptively calm environmental conditions. Uh, these sediments erode quite rapidly. The upper half of the cliff is actually sandy. It's post-Miocene sediments. These are uh, Pliocene or Pleistocene sediments. So this, this uh, part of Calvert Cliffs probably erodes faster than any other uh, section of, of the cliffs. Here's a photograph of the same area uh, during Hurricane Hannah some years ago that came up the bay and uh, just hundreds of thousands of tons of sediment were moved during a storm event like this. It just uh, really amazed me how much a transformation there was in the face of the cliff and in the large slump piles that had built up at the base of the cliff were all sort of removed and reworked. And so it's a great uh, time to go out after a storm like this and look for fossils. So now I'm gonna show you a couple of photographs of us excavating fossils along the cliffs. Uh, this is uh, just south of Plum Point, and it's during the winter. And um, 
On the left-hand side of the uh, photograph, you can see John Nance, who is our paleontology collections manager here at the museum. He's up on a ladder and he's excavating in this really prime layer of fossils. He's working on a fossil dolphin skull. And you'll notice that the beach is quite wide. This is somewhat unusual because on the day that we were out, uh, we were experiencing what we refer to as blowout tide. So it happens when there's a high pressure system that is actually pushing the water out of the bay and also the sun and moon were, were cooperating. And so it was a naturally a low tide and the wind was blowing from the Northwest. And so the wind was also helping to push the water out of the bay. And so this is a, a, a great opportunity to walk, uh, walk the, the beach just below the cliffs and find fossils that have eroded naturally out of, uh, out of the cliff face and are laying on the beach uh, to be picked up. This photograph is the same area uh, during the summer when we don't have a blowout tide. And uh, this photograph was taken while we were excavating a long snouted dolphin skull, one of these urina delphinids. I'll show you a photograph of one of these towards the end of my presentation. The skulls are about four feet long. And this particular skull happened to be going directly into the cliff face. So it was lengthwise of the skull was perpendicular to the cliff face. And we had to dig this rather large hole, not because the skull is large, but in order to physically get a human body into to reach the front of the skull, to put the, the bandaging, the jacket, the field jacket, the natural, the cast rather, around the, the fossil skull. You can see right here at the base of the hole, these are the bandages. These are gypsum bandages. They're basically a cheesecloth that's um, impregnated with plaster of Paris and you just soak them in water. It's what doctors used to use to make casts for broken bones. Now they mostly use fiberglass, uh, but we love these because they're, they're, they're basically what paleontologists have been using for 200 years. Um, instead of using burlap and plaster, we use these gypsona bandages for, for smaller skulls. We still use burlap soaked in plaster of Paris like they used to do historically uh, to excavate a large heavy skull because we need that strength that the burlap offers. But here, excavating this relatively small skull, even though it's four feet long, it's relatively light, we were able to use these gypsum bandages. And I'm carrying a stick that uh, we laminated into the field jacket with the gypsum bandages so that we could carry our, our dolphin skull out at the end of the day. Uh, the gentleman who is next to me wearing the Guinness uh, t-shirt uh, was a, a rocket scientist. He retired from his engineering position at uh, Naval Air Station Pax River. And he came out and worked with us this particular day. And his, his task was to keep this wall intact so that the water would not come in and flood uh, our excavation site. So now what I'm gonna do for the balance of my talk is just show you some of the diversity of fossils that have been found along Calvert Cliffs. There are over 600 different species of organisms that have been found and documented along the cliffs as fossils. So it's a really important uh, fossil location along the Atlantic Coastal Plain and it's certainly world famous amongst geologists and paleontologists. So there are untold trillions of microscopic fossils in the sediments. All you need is a teaspoonful of sediment and uh, you can pull out forams and diatoms. And each one of these uh, different kinds of microscopic fossils is important in its own right. It has an evolutionary history, it has an ancestor and it has descendants. Uh, but geologists love these because they're really good indicators of prehistoric environment. Because in life, they had preferences as to the temperature of the water they lived in, the salinity of the water and the water depth. And so by, by studying the diversity uh, of microfossils in each one of the layers along the cliffs, we can reconstruct what environmental conditions were like at the time those sediments were being deposited. There are over 400 different kinds of mollusks that have been uh, collected and uh, identified and described from along the cliffs. So if I was to do justice uh, in terms of numbers, I would spend most of my time on the mollusks. And there are some really beautiful ones, as you can see here, some gastropods and uh, bivalves. Um, but as I mentioned, I'm gonna focus primarily on the vertebrates. Uh, there's also echinoderms, so sand dollar you can see in the lower left-hand corner. There are brittle stars and there are sea stars that have been found here. There are also barnacles, which encrust on, on a lot of the clamshells. And they're filter feeders, right? They open up their valves, movable valves, and they have an arm that comes out and they're filter feeding. There are also uh, bryozoans, 
that are found along the cliffs. These are colonial animals and uh, corals. Now the corals were not, were not reef forming corals. These were um, solitary colonial type corals and uh, not a lot of diversity in the corals that were here. We also can, um, we also can brag about having the world's largest fossil crab found along Calvert Cliffs. And this is a spider crab. And so in the upper left-hand uh, part of the uh, image here, you can see uh, there's the body of, central part of the body of the spider crab. And then spider crabs are characterized by having these greatly elongate limbs. And so they extend out on, uh, on both sides of the animals. You can see this, uh, this uh, uh, image at the bottom here of a modern spider crab. And in the lower right-hand uh, corner of the photograph, you can see a section of one of the limbs, one of the pinchers, the claws at the end of the limb. And you can see how badly broken uh, the, uh, the fossil actually is the original material that comprised the claw. So this fossil is exceedingly delicate. Uh, it's very, very rare, uh, but they do occur here along, uh, along the cliffs. Now, most of the avocational or amateur paleontologists who walk along the cliffs are hoping to find a megalodon tooth. So a megalodon was um, the largest apex predator uh, during the Miocene, certainly as a shark. And um, from time to time, we find the fossilized bones of whales and dolphins that have been marked by megalodon teeth uh, biting down on them. And so we know that Megalodon was highly specialized at feeding on whales and dolphins. They had sort of the, the evolutionary lineage that, that, that eventually gave rise to Megalodon. Uh, we usually start the story about 60 million years ago with a shark that was about the size of a living great white shark. And uh, they increased in size through that 60 million year period of time. And uh, their teeth became increasingly specialized at actually cutting as opposed to just puncturing and swallowing an animal whole, which their ancestors did, uh, they started feeding on much larger prey. So they became macro predators. And so in order to feed on an animal that's, that's um, very large, that you can't swallow whole, you have to cut out pieces. And so their teeth are superbly well adapted at cutting. They have a very fine serrated edge. And uh, in the course of their feeding, of course, their teeth would have impacted the bones and uh, the teeth and left marks on the bones that we can now study. And so here's an example. In the lower part of uh, the photograph here, the slide, you can see that there is an elongate bone. It's actually part of the lower jaw of a small baleen or filter feeding whale from the Miocene. And in the upper left part of the photograph, you can see where, uh, with my cursor here, you can see where the megalodon, the edge of the megalodon tooth struck the bone and then the serrations, the little bumpy a steak knife-like edge of the megalodon tooth then raked the surface here of the whale lower jaw, leaving a calling card, leaving evidence that megalodon uh, really um, interacted with this whale. So we don't know from markings like this if uh, they're the result of predation of the megalodon actually killing the whale, or perhaps the whale was already dead and it was just scavenging the already dead whale carcass. That we can't tell from markings like this. So the next bone that I'm going to show you is from a Miocene dolphin. And it's one of these black bones down just in front of the tail flute that moves the dolphin through the water. So this illustrates one of the most common types of dolphins that we find along Calvert Cliffs. And uh, so these three views of this tailbone you'll notice that there are these deep gouges on both sides of the vertebra. In a normal vertebra, these deep gouges would not be there. In fact, the only way that you can get deep gouges like this on both sides of the vertebra is if the vertebra at one point became wedged between two adjacent megalodon teeth. So clearly, at the end of this dolphin's life, it had an encounter with megalodon. And uh, I think this illustrates nicely uh, what was happening, that Megalodon wasn't just a scavenger, that from time to time, it chased down, hunted down, and bit the caudal peduncle of, of its prey of dolphins. 
So we know that living great white sharks will do the same thing. They'll disable their prey by biting the tail uh, so that they bleed out. And so then you're just eating a dead animal. You're just scavenging as opposed to eating a, a, a live animal. And so Megalodon would have bitten. But what's interesting, if I go back to this illustration, that uh, this photograph rather, that shows the markings on the sides of this tailbone, each one of these gouges uh, represents a separate bite by the Megalodon. So it's as though Megalodon was really aggressively, repeatedly biting that tail to ensure that that dolphin would not get away, would bleed out, and then it could eat it. I just wanna say one more thing about the Megalodon teeth. Uh, we think that uh, you know we're the first people who've had an interest in fossils. But in fact, we've found quite a number of fossilized teeth, including those of Megalodon, uh, in archeological context around the Chesapeake Bay. And so uh, Amerindians, Native Americans, Native Indians were, were collecting and using these teeth for tools, for cutting implements, for projectile points, and for personal adornment. In fact, uh, teeth from this area have been found as far west as burial mounds in Ohio. And so we know that there was this sort of trading, collecting and trading of fossil shark teeth um, hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. So there are about 50 different kinds of fossilized sharks and rays that have been found as fossils along Calvert Cliffs. And this is just an illustration that shows some of the more common types of sharks that are found along the cliffs. And from time to time, we do find shark teeth that are embedded in the bones of whales and dolphins. And so the bone that you're seeing here is actually uh, an upper arm bone, the humerus, one of the flipper bones in a whale. And you can see again, the, the bite marks, the gouge marks here on the surface, but the yellow arrow is pointing to a tip of probably a gray shark that uh, forcefully bit down so hard that the tooth broke or came out of the jaw and remained embedded in, uh, in the body of, uh, of the humerus of this whale. And so here's an illustration showing uh, what might have happened. The whale might have been alive or more likely it was dead at the time that the bite, uh, biting occurred by the great shark. We also have this really interesting fossil. It's actually part of a tail vertebra from a gray shark. And the blue arrow is pointing at two small gray shark teeth that are embedded in the vertebra. This is the first example in the fossil record of shark on shark predation, where a shark came along and bit another shark um, and uh, so forcefully that two teeth became embedded in that vertebra. This is perhaps the most unusual and perhaps the rarest kind of fossil uh, that I've ever seen from along Calvert Cliffs. And when I give this talk uh, in front of a, a live audience, I mean, um, in person, I should say, I usually ask, I ask people to, uh, you know, hazard a guess as to what they think this is. And in this situation, it's a little bit difficult to get feedback immediately. So I'm just gonna tell you that you can see here over the, over the surface of this object, there are tooth impressions. They're actually shark tooth impressions. And what's fascinating is the material in which the shark teeth are impressed is, uh, is a coprolite. So coprolite is a technical term that we give to fossilized feces. So here we have just an unbelievably rare example in the fossil record of something that you would never expect to find, shark tooth impressions uh, preserved in fecal matter that then became fossilized and is now referred to as a coprolite. So it's a shark bitten coprolite. And in this uh, photograph, you can see the gentleman who found it and where it was found at a place called Western Shores. Um, we don't know why we typically find coprolites in this area. And we think the coprolites actually came from crocodiles. They have all the diagnostic characteristics of crocodilian coprolites. So during the Miocene, there were crocodiles that were li lived here. They were marine or saltwater crocodiles. And I'll show illustrations of, of those to you in just a few minutes. So because these are in tooth impressions, what I did was I built a little plaster scene wall uh, perimeter around the tooth impressions. And I mixed up a silicon rubber casting compound and I poured it in. 
and it infilled the tooth impressions, the negative. And after it cured, I was able to peel it out and, and look at the positive. And so in the bottom of this photograph, you can see then the shape of the tooth impressions that were made into the copper light. And these match most closely a fossil tiger shark that we have here along Calvert Cliffs. So this copper light was bitten by a tiger shark. Uh, so if you're like me, you become curious about, well, what's the backstory? Like what, what happened and, and why did this incredibly rare fossil form? Well, it's possible that a crocodile voided, defecated in the water and the feces were just floating there and a tiger shark came up to it and bit it. Uh, but obviously it decided not to consume it uh, because those tooth impressions would not have survived passage of the feces through the digestive system of, of the shark. And so it, it, um, it decided <laughs> not today, I'm just not that hungry. And then the copper light would have sank to the bottom of the ocean, been entombed and, and, and preserved as a fossil. But what's fascinating, and I don't have a photograph of this in this presentation, but if you flip the fossil over uh, on the other side, um, there are deep impressions on one side, but on the other side, there are very faint impressions, which suggests to me that maybe something else was going on. Maybe the shark didn't just come up to this and bite it with both upper and lower teeth, because I would expect for tooth impressions from the upper jaw and the lower jaw to equally penetrate the fresh feces, but that did not happen. So I came up with this idea that perhaps the feces were still within the body of the marine crocodile that the tiger shark plowed into with such force that its teeth penetrated the abdominal wall and penetrated into the feces that way. And in, term, in, in the course of disemboweling uh, its prey, the crocodile, the feces then were released, were not ingested and sank to the bottom and, and became preserved. And uh, 15 million years later were found by Dougie Douglas and brought to my office. I can't prove that, but it makes a great story. So there are over 50 different kinds of bony fish that have been uh, found and identified from along Calvert Cliffs. And if you saw any one of these, they have modern representatives. Some of them are very closely related to their modern relatives. And so you would feel very much at home if you were fishing here during the Miocene. Uh, there are some remarkable examples of preservation of fish skeletons. In the upper left-hand corner, there's a scallop shell. And you can see that when the scallop shell was open, the collector who found it, he collected the scallop and both valves, both, both um, halves of the shell were, were together. And when he got it home and he opened up the valve, one of the valves, uh, inside it was a fish skeleton. And you can see the skull of uh, the fish right here towards the perimeter of the scallop shell. In the lower right-hand corner, there is a lovely example, the only one that we have from along Calvert Cliffs, virtually the entire skeleton of a little poacher, a little poacher fish. And these tiny fish are characterized by having very bold and pointed, um, almost like porcupines, uh, a scalation along their body. And you can see the scales here. This is the head up at this end of the body. So there's also diversity of turtles that have been found along Calvert Cliffs, marine turtles, as well as uh, land or pond turtles. Uh, there's a very large leatherback turtle, which had a carapace, a shell that was uh, eight feet long. And so you had an animal that was nine to 10 feet long, a huge leatherback turtle. There's one living species today. And these Miocene leatherback turtles had a carapace, had a shell that was comprised of thousands of little bony scutes that fit together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Modern Leatherback turtles just have a leathery, uh, a leathery uh, covering over their ribs. They don't have a bony carapace, certainly like the Miocene dolphins did. And there, then there was a variety of other kinds of sea turtles that lived here. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see the young lady is holding one of these large leatherback turtle uh, hum humeri, uh, humerus from the flipper, front flipper of, uh, of the leatherback turtle. Here's the marine crocodile that I referred to earlier, Theca champsa. And these animals are most closely related to the false gharials, the uh, Tomistema that live in Southeast Asia today. So they're uh, further evidence that the global climate was much warmer. Well, I shouldn't say much warmer. It was warmer, uh, five to seven degrees warmer during the Miocene than uh, on average than it is today. Now, for the most part, we just find isolated teeth from these crocodiles, but from time to time, we also find their scoots. 
So the scoot is that uh, textured bone that has all these circular pits in it. And it's very characteristic. You just need to find a small piece on one of these scoots to know for sure that you have uh, a scoot from, a, from, an alley, from a crocodile. Now these scoots were bones that were embedded in the skin that went from behind the skull all the way down to the end of the tail. And they're basically a body armor that protected these uh, large marine crocodiles. There is a diversity of pelagic or oceanic bird fossils that have been found. Now, as you can appreciate, a bird skeleton is exceedingly delicate. And so we only typically, we only typically find isolated bones of, uh, of these oceanic birds, but from time to time, uh, exceptional specimens have been found, like this ox skull that's uh, shown here in the photograph in the lower left-hand corner of the slide. We have also found along Calvert Cliffs remains of the largest flying bird that ever lived, an animal called Pelagornis. It had an 18-foot wingspan, and uh, they would have spent much of their life, like modern albatross do, on the wing, uh, catching uh, slippery prey like squid and fish. They had false teeth on the, on, in, in the lower and upper jaws. They had little bony prongs. They're not teeth. They're just bony prongs that would have been covered with the, uh, the beak of the bird and would have been extended and would have made a very effective uh, tool for capturing slippery bodied animals that they would have uh, fed upon. This is another remarkable example of a fossil preservation that has been found along Calvert Cliffs. As you can see, it's a, it's a feather impression. Uh, the material in which it's impressed is again a coprolite. It's fossilized feces. And here's the specimen uh, photographed here, the circle. Uh, it represents just a, an outline of where the feather is here. But uh, in this coprolite, feathers are swirled all throughout it. And so what probably happened is that uh, one of these crocodiles ate a bird and uh, feathers, keratin is very resistant uh, to acid degradation. And even though crocodiles have acid contents uh, in their digestive system that are 50 times more powerful than those of mammals, it didn't dissolve, at least to this individual, didn't dissolve the feathers. And they passed right through the digestive system of the crocodile, leaving these beautiful impressions in the feces. And uh, they're so impressive that you can take a small piece of this and put it under a scanning electron microscope and photograph it. And what you're looking at here are adjacent barbs uh, in the feather. So you have the vein of the feather with the, sh the, the, the central shaft of the feather and coming off of that are the barbs. And holding the barbs together are the little Velcro-like mechanism, the barbules that keep the vein of the feather together while the bird is flying or just the, the body feather. So now we're going to look at some of the diversity of land mammals that we have uh, collected from along the cliffs. And uh, for the most part, we only have the remains of, of large land animals. The smallest one would be a pig-like creature. We don't know of any of the smaller land mammals uh, or even the, the snakes and uh, um, the herps that lived here, the frogs and salamanders and also lizards and snakes. We don't know anything about those. None of those have ever been identified from along the cliffs. So we think the way to get a large fossil of a large land animal into the ocean is that um, the animal died while trying to cross a river and its body or carcass was carried out into the ocean. And so it bloated uh, while it was decomposing and the abdominal cavity filled up with gases. And as it was decomposing, then its bones were then falling to the ocean floor and being preserved. And so since teeth, are the hardest parts of a mammalian skeleton. That's the most likely thing that's to be preserved as a fossil along the cliffs. And so here you can see that there are Miocene elephant teeth that have been found and they're beautiful. And you can tell that these are large animals from the size of the molars. We've also found the teeth of juveniles in the left-hand side. And the one that's in the palm of the hand over here is actually a deciduous. It's a milk tooth from a baby elephant that lived during the Miocene. We've also found the remains of rhinos. Rhino teeth are very characteristic. All you need is a small piece of rhino tooth to know for sure that that's what you have. And the rhinos that lived here were actually like giant pot-bellied pigs. They had very broad uh, rib cages, barrel-shaped torsos, uh, but they had stubby short legs. And you can see here from the bone that's photographed in the uh, lower right-hand 
part of this slide. This is the full length of a tibia of a lower leg bone uh, as indicated by the blue arrow. And uh, this is not uh, the tibia of a juvenile rhino. It's actually a fully mature adult rhinoceros. And so you can see uh, compared to our human uh, scale that they were relatively stubby legged animals. There were also camels that were here and their remains are exceedingly, exceedingly rare. Peccaries, these are small pig-like creatures. Uh, it's a separate family than the, the suidae, than the pigs. And um, uh, there, there are peccaries that are alive today that live in the southwestern United States and uh, south into, into Mexico. And so there would have been little herds of these animals running around. Uh, these are herbivores, artiodactyls, cloven hoofed animals. And they would have been the most, probably the most common land mammal that lived uh, here during the Miocene. In terms of the carnivores, there were dog-like creatures. And also in the lower part of the slide, you can see that there were these giant hyena-like animals called amphicyonids or bear dogs uh, that were probably the top predators here during the Miocene. They had massive teeth, huge canines and crushing dentition. So they would have been like hyenas, as I've mentioned, crushing the bones of their prey. Now, moving back into the marine environment, uh, looking at some of the marine mammals, there were seals that were here, and we have this beautiful example of a seal skull. We've also found sperm whales. So sperm whales during the Miocene, uh, them were, were much smaller than the large sperm whales that live today. And so the skull that's illustrated here is only about a foot and a half long. And so this is a tiny sperm whale, much more like uh, Koji, like the pygmy sperm whales that live today. And so there is a diversity of very long snouted dolphins, as I've mentioned previously and shown you photographs of us excavating them along the cliffs. This is the most common type of long snouted dolphin. And uh, they probably used that snout, which didn't have teeth it, to stir up the sediment, to, uh, to, to stir up prey, or else to slash it back and forth uh, through schools of fish in order to stun them before they uh, engulfed them. Here's another example of a long snouted dolphin, a platinistid that's related to the Ganges River dolphin. They were marine animals and they had teeth in both upper and lower jaws all the way to the very front. And so they would have been very effective at uh, snatching uh, fish out of the water. So Kentriodontid type dolphins, these would have been mostly like modern bottlenose or delphinid type dolphins. And there's a diversity of these that are also known. So this illustration, this uh, little movie that you're now watching is actually a bone that's about the size of the end of your thumb. And it's called the periodic. And it's integral to the hearing apparatus in dolphins. And the periodic houses the cochlea, the cochlear apparatus, which is the snail-like coil that winds around inside of this. And it allows dolphins to discriminate different frequencies of sound, just like in us, we have a cochlear apparatus. Uh, this bone also uh, housed the semicircular canals, which we have, uh, but were very small in these kinds of dolphins, which allowed them to orient themselves in, in, in space, in, in the water, to know which way was up. And so this little movie is being made, was made from hundreds of micro CT scans that were made of the periodic of one of the kinds of uh, um, country daunted type dolphins that have been found that was found along Calvert Cliffs. And so we can tell from looking at the, co the cochlear apparatus that it had the ability to echolocate uh, with the same degree of accuracy and efficacy as do modern delphinids. And so we're going to finish off with the baleen whales. Uh, this is a skull that we collected some years ago. Uh, there's a diversity, there's five or six different kinds of baleen whales that have been found along Calvert Cliffs. And this skull, this is the way that we excavated it uh, after Hurricane Isabel. So that's quite a number of years ago. Uh, but the jacket weighed about a thousand pounds. And here we are uh, trying to pull the jacket away from the base of the cliff. We've jacketed it, we've put burlap and plaster around the skull, and we're trying to skid it out um, to get it away from the base of the cliff because we were able to convince the search and rescue team at Naval Air Station Pax River that they should come and rescue this uh, whale skull, pretending that it was a downed pilot. So they, they maintain a search and rescue team that can go out at a moment's notice to rescue a pilot if their airplane goes down in the Chesapeake Bay. 
And so here they came and they pretended that the whale skull was a downed pilot. And here you can see the large Sea King helicopter. And there's a gentleman that is uh, rappelling down from the helicopter and he's called the swimmer. And he's carrying the cable with him down to hook onto the, uh, the whale jacket so that uh, it could be moved from here over across the river where we could pick it up with a pickup truck and bring it back to the museum where it was prepared and now it's on display. So um, I have an exceedingly fortunate position here at the Marine Museum. I'm able to play with fossils every day and conduct research on these fossils. And I love when fossils tell extra stories. And so basically I'm a storyteller. I describe the fossils and uh, if there are shark bite marks on them or something else about it, I love to tell those stories and include those in publications or in, uh, we have a fossil club and our fossil club newsletter um, also has um, a diversity of fossils that have been found in this area by club members and ones that are donated to, to our museum. In fact, most of the fossils that we have in our collection have actually been found by amateur collectors and donated to us. So uh, we, we are very fortunate to be in the situation where our collection grows faster because of the contribution of avocational paleontologists donating their collections to us. So the Calvert Marine Museum is actually part of Calvert County government. So I'm a county employee and it's unusual for a county, for any county, but um, especially one the size of Calvert County, well, one of the smallest counties in the state of Maryland to have a museum. And uh, this photograph was taken on our waterfront of the Drum Point Lighthouse, which uh, when it was decommissioned by the Coast Guard was moved to our campus and it was restored. And it's, so now it's one of our exhibits. So we have lovely exhibits that concentrate on maritime history, on estuarine biology. So we have aquariums with uh, some of the diversity of the life that uh, occurs today in the Chesapeake Bay. And we also have paleontology. And so that's my mandate, uh, as was mentioned uh, early on, that I'm to collect, preserve, and interpret. And I'm, I'm exceedingly blessed to be able to interpret the fossil resource here along uh, Calvert Cliffs. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those questions for you now. Uh, so thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, all right, everyone, if you have a question, um, please type it in the chat and it's basically first come first serve. So we have one uh, right on, on board here. Uh, so what is the best way to see the fossils along Calvert Cliffs? Is it by kayak? Uh, you, you probably. So one of the unfortunate things about Calvert County is that most of the access to the cliffs is privately owned. And so there are only a certain few public access places along the cliffs. And that's made even worse now because of COVID. Uh, some of the places that were public access have closed down to sort of the general public and are only open to local residents. And so it's really frustrating. So We've spent years getting to know the landowners, many of the landowners along the class. And many of those landowners are very generous in granting us access to their property if a fossil comes up. So usually it's only a phone call away for them to grant us permission to be able to excavate. So there's a lot of people that will come in by boat or will or know somebody or come in uh, through private property. They have, they, have, they have legal access and they walk the class. And if they see a bone or something that's unusual eroding from the cliffs, they will uh, let us know. And uh, then we can go out and get permission. And if, it, if it's worthy of being excavated, we will excavate the fossil and bring it back and prepare it and preserve it in archival jackets here in perpetuity uh, for the general public um, here at the Marine Museum. But yes, if, if you want to gain access to the cliffs, the best way is to come in by boat, jet ski, or motorboat, uh, shallow draft, or a kayak is a really good way to see the clips, yes. All right, wonderful. Uh, actually, you then answered uh, the second question about like, are any of these parts open to the public? Uh, you know, but I, I, there are many, most uh, are, are private. So that, thank you for letting them know that. Um, all right, so the next one is, uh, who did your illustrations? Ah, uh, I, Yes, so it was actually in the last slide and I should have brought that up. Um, it was actually, uh, most of the illustrations were done by one of our former resident artists. We have an amazing exhibits department here at the Marine Museum. We do most of our exhibits in-house and Tim Shire, 
uh, was uh, our exhibit. He retired about a year ago. He was here for many years and he was a very gifted or is a very gifted uh, illustrator. He's old school, so he doesn't do anything digitally. Uh, his replacement uh, shoe shoemaker is actually both old school, but he also does digital illustrations. So Shu has taken some of Tim's black and white illustrations and has colorized them in Photoshop. So um, I'm, I'm exceedingly fortunate to be surrounded by uh, amazingly gifted artists who can uh, do some of these life restorations for me to help bring some of these stories to life. Well, and Kent also asked, how did Hags get you to come and talk? Because it was a great presentation. How? Yes. Oh, I gave a presentation to a geologist, I've forgotten his name, in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, Amy was there, uh, heard the talk, and invited me. And I'm, I'm delighted to speak to you. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, Will wants to know, what geologic formation and member is the most fossiliferous in the Miocene. I, I don't know if they're talking generally Miocene or right there Miocene. So along Calvert Cliffs, the, the thickest, so there are three formations, the lower Calvert, the middle Chop Tank, and the upper St. Mary's formation. So most of the sediments that comprise the cliff are made up of the lower Calvert formation. And within the Calvert formation, it's the Plum Point member that uh, is the most highly fossiliferous. And within that, it's the Shattuck zone, zones 10 and 12 that have the highest concentration of, uh, of mollusk shells and also shark, fossil shark teeth along covered cliffs. Cool. Um, could you please expound on your consultation for the movie, The Meg. <laughs> you know, I don't know where that came from because I actually didn't. <laughs> I wish I had, because I love the movie. Um, you know, it was so outlandish that I was just laughing through much of the movie, but I mean, I love the restoration of, of the Megalodons that they had in the movie. And I think they did a really good uh, job with their with their um, you know their animation and the the models that they made. They're beautiful restorations of megalodon, but it's absolutely impossible that so megalodon evolved to prey upon warm-blooded, warm-bodied, shallow water marine mammals. The whole evolutionary history was tracking the evolution of whales, and so they're exceedingly specialized. And in fact, we think one of the reasons why Megalodon became extinct was that because some of the, of the kinds of baleen whales that they were feeding on became extinct. Now, there are other reasons that have also been proposed for why we think Megalodon became extinct about three and a half million years ago, but that's one of them. And uh, so if you have an animal that's exceedingly specialized at feeding on baleen whales, um, it's inconceivable that uh, in the past two and a half million years that somehow Megalodon has been able to adapt to live in the, in the deepest part of the ocean and go undetected while remaining basically the same kind of animal. It's just inconceivable. And so um, at that depth, their skeleton wouldn't, wouldn't uh, mineralize and they wouldn't find the prey that they need to, to feed on to sustain their metabolic rate. And so for those reasons, uh, the whole premise of the movie is flawed, but I still love the movie. Um, what, what did happen to me some years ago was there was a mockumentary that Discovery Channel made on Megalodon. And the premise of that was that Megalodon was in fact still alive. And they came and interviewed me for that, but I didn't know that that was going to be the reason for this documentary. And I gave them all kinds of, what I thought was really interesting uh, information about Megalodon. And I showed them a diversity of fossils that I, that I uh, have published on, which show interaction between um, Megalodon and these whales. And they didn't use any of them. Uh, they just used like a, a sound bite of me saying, uh, extraordinary, uh, it's, it's from, it's uh, taken from Carl Sagan. It's extraordinary evidence, uh, extra, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And uh, so I appear in this mockumentary, but I'm not named. <laughs> So, uh, but more recently, 
I've been able to work with Curiosity Stream. This is an online documentary platform. It, it's by subscription. Um, and uh, they came here to the museum and they, they interviewed both myself and our assistant curator of paleontology, Dr. Victor Perez, who is an expert in fossil sharks and has published on Megalodon. And it was a treat to work with them because they were genuinely interested in the science of Megalodon. And uh, they, they allowed us, they, they sent us the editor's cut of, of their documentary and they allowed us to comment on it so that they would get it right in terms of the science of Megalodon. And so uh, if you have an interest, you can look that up. Uh, it's called Decoding Megalodon and it's on Curiosity Stream. But that was, I, I really enjoyed working with them. So yeah, that's my Megalodon story. That's pretty awesome. Um, so uh, for folk, uh, just so you know, to answer one of the questions, um, uh, this is uh, uh, being recorded on our website. So uh, we will be able to- Oh yes, uh, I see from one of the answers, Jerry Jones. Okay, thank you, Jerry, for, for answering the question. Yeah, it was with, with Jerry Jones. <laughs> I had a great time with that group uh, speaking to them. Uh, in his rock room, so. Uh, so uh, Phil wanted to know that there was a very large whale skeleton removal that made it into the news uh, in that area. Can you elaborate? Do you remember the, uh, the, the that particular moment? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Uh, I said, uh, uh, Phil asked that in the past, sometime in the recent past, there was a large whale removal, like a like a fossil that was in the news and he didn't know if you knew anything about that. I, I'm not sure if he's referring to uh, us excavating along Calvert Cliffs because we, we take out probably one whale skull a year and probably four or five dolphin skulls a year from along the cliffs. And so uh, we do attempt, we photo document those and, and videotape some of that excavation. And we always like to have press releases about the work that we're doing along Calvert Cliffs. Uh, Robert asked, have you been the Perth State Park and seen the Turritella exposures? Are those also Miocene? Okay, yes, yeah, so the, the sediments that are preserved at Perth State Park are much older. Uh, they're from the Aquia Formation, which is Paleocene. So they're about 50 million years old. So they're uh, two to three times older than the sediments that we have preserved along Calvert Cliffs. And yes, they're the very the large uh, Turritella mortoni that occur there and they're abundant actually. Uh, but we also have a different species of Turritella, several that occur along Calvert Cliffs, which are also, there's just trillions of uh, Turritellas that are preserved in this vast layer cake of sediment, of uh, Miocene sediments. Um, I see a question here, are the fossils found on private land owned by the landowner or are they considered the property of Maryland state? That's a good question. So within the state of Maryland, uh, fossils that occur on private land are owned by the property owner. Uh, if they're found on state property. We have an agreement with uh, the state of Maryland for a section of the cliffs that they own, which is very productive. And uh, so those fossils are, are owned by the state of Maryland, but we house them here at the Marine Museum. We'll house them in perpetuity because there's no official, well, well actually we, we have now become the official repository for fossils within the state of Maryland. Uh, but the state itself doesn't, doesn't uh, sponsor a paleontological uh, institute or collection. So we are the de facto state center for paleontology within the state of Maryland. Um, so that's why when we do find a fossil along the cliffs, uh, most of the time it's on private property. And so, like I mentioned, we, we have gotten to know a lot of landowners and most of them are very generous in allowing us to excavate the fossils that occur on their property. Are there any boreholes or core holes uh, from Calvert County that drilled through like fossils since they're so um, common in the, the formation? Yes, you, you could not drill uh, down uh, through the sediments in Calvert County and not encounter fossils. You're gonna go through one of these layers that's just like chock chock full of, of, uh, of shells of mollusks and uh, they're gonna come up yet yeah, when you pull the core up. Uh, do you have any suggestions uh, on safe places to, to go kayaking from that are nearby? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Since I'm not a kayaker, I don't typically put in at one. So there are some marinas along Calvert Cliffs. 
And uh, that would be pretty much your only access. You'd have to put in, I guess, your kayak at a marina or know somebody in a private community that has a boat launch. Uh, so there's Breezy Point Beach, which is towards the north end of Calvert Cliff, south of the town of Chesapeake Beach on, I think it's Highway 261. A Breezy Point, you could kayak south from Breezy Point to, um, to Plum Point and see the cliffs there. They're very impressive. I was out there yesterday morning. Uh, we had a bit of a party, 60th birthday party for a fossil collector who was out every day. This guy retired early so that he could collect fossils. He's exceedingly passionate about paleontology and gets out along the cliffs every day, just remarkable. So that would be probably the easiest access for someone coming from the north would be to put in at Breezy Point Beach. Uh, latest question from Robert. Uh, in Maryland, are you allowed to walk on the shore between the high and low tide zone? Uh, or is it, is it private property all the way to the water? So in Maryland, the private property extends down to the mean high tide. And so you can walk below the high tide line along any beach in Calvert County, although I would not suggest that you try to do that uh, where, the, where the nuclear power plant is, nor try that where the uh, liquefied natural gas plant is. Uh, they have security and they get very uh, antsy about anybody coming close to their property post 9-11. Um, but elsewhere along the cliffs, yes, you can walk the beach and uh, you can't dig into the cliffs because as I mentioned, private property extends down to the mean high tide line. So the cliffs are all privately owned. So if you see a fossil in the cliffs, you can't dig it out. But if the fossil is on the beach, you can pick it up. And virtually all the shell material that's on the beach, uh, they're Miocene shells. There's only a few types of mollusks that inhabit the Chesapeake Bay today because of the low salinity. So the vast majority of the shell material or the corals that you find along the cliffs are Miocene in age. Um, so uh, another question about, uh, is there any particular area about look, finding shark teeth? Yeah, I typically recommend that people go to Bayfront Park. It's uh, one of the, it's the most northern access to the cliffs, and it's just south of the town of Chesapeake Beach on Highway 261. The problem now is that I believe that beach is closed to non-residents of the town of Chesapeake Beach because of COVID, and I have no sense as to when that beach will open up to the general public. So usually what I would say is, go up after Labor Day and before Memorial Day, because then they don't charge you. But if you go in the summer months, like they charge you an outrageous amount to park and access the beach. But if you go after Labor Day, then uh, there's, there's no charge. But I think now uh, there might be signage to the effect that, um, you know, it's only open to, to residents of the town of Chesapeake Beach. Uh, the, what I mentioned previously, Breezy Point is another uh, point of access, which is just a little bit to, couple miles further south. And uh, there you can't really access the cliffs, but if you spend time on the beach, right where the water is curling, right where, where the, uh, the waves are breaking, and you scoop up the coarser sandy gravelly type material and toss it up onto the beach and let the waves wash it, you will be able to find the tiny gray shark teeth, which comprise most of the fossil shark teeth that occur along Calvert Cliffs. Uh, do the uh, same rules uh, of if you find the fossil, you know, in the, the surf, apply for whether it be vertebrate or marine or anything like that? Yeah, so if you happen to, to go along the cliffs when there was a blowout tide, or you're walking on clay and it's below, uh, there's no sand covering it, you're on the, actually one of these fossiliferous clay layers, and you see a bone or a skull embedded in that clay layer, if it's below the mean high tide, which it will be, you don't have to have permission from anybody to excavate that fossil. Now, I would dissuade you from trying to excavate a fossil because if you're not experienced, you're just gonna destroy it. So what we typically do is we would build a coffer dam and we would go in and we would properly excavate it and jacket it so that we could bring it back to the museum. But if you found an isolated vertebra, 
uh, dig around it. Don't just try to pry the bone out itself because you will almost certainly break it. So you have to dig around it. Give yourself a perimeter of a couple of inches around the fossil and dig down and try to take out not just the fossil, but the sediment in which the fossil is entombed. And if you can get, uh, now maybe at uh, some of these craft stores, you can buy these gypsum bandages and maybe online you could get, want to get serious. You could bring one of these along and sort of jack it, the fossil. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to find an intact bone at the base of the cliff. Uh, you're more likely to find a bone that has eroded out of the face of the cliff that's already just loose on the beach. You might find a part of a vertebra or a section of rib from a whale or dolphin. So that would be much more likely than finding a bone or a skull in, in situ intact in the sediment. I see the question, do you run field trips at Calvert Cliffs? We do, uh, although not quite as many as we used to. We have a fossil club here at the Marine Museum and we meet quarterly. We also have a newsletter, the Exfora, which is uh, archived online at the calvertmarinemuseum.com in our paleontology uh, section. So our September issue just came out and I wor I'm working on the December issue. Uh, so we do have a fossil club and the fossil club hosts field trips for fossil club members. So in order to be a member of the fossil club, you also have to be a, a member of the Calvert Marine Museum Society. And so there's a family membership, there's an individual membership, and then you become a member for $10, um, a member of the fossil club. Uh, our, exit, our, sorry, our education department also runs field trips out to Cove Point. And you can see the cliffs, but you're not right below the cliffs, so it's very safe there. And they collect a shark teeth on the beach there at Cove Point. So you could sign up, you would go to calvertmarinemuseum.com. And uh, I don't know if there's any more uh, field trips this year, but that's where you would look for our field trips for, um, that are hosted by our education department, as opposed to ones that would be hosted by the fossil club. Okay, um, so unless anyone has any further questions, that was a lot of questions. Thank you so much. Um, for that. Uh, I think that uh, that's probably uh, going to be it for the questions. Uh, Kent, do you want to have a final say? Thank you, Stephen. Uh, appreciate your talk. It was interesting. And uh, yeah, I found that uh, link on the megalodon on the internet so it has to be the truth <laughs> okay thank you we'll uh, go with it yeah yeah and uh again thanks a lot thanks for uh, connecting with us uh this group is uh yeah we, we ask questions and we enjoy much the uh the presentations uh and and that's the reason why we are here and we we really appreciate your coming coming along to uh to talk to us thanks again yeah sure my pleasure it's been a great group to talk to so thank you all right everyone thank you again to our speaker and thank you all for coming i'm going to be ending the meeting and the recording shortly so thank you again bye-bye